Very good morning to you and thanks for joining us on another very exciting edition of The Run-Up. My name is Nyamgul Agaji and my colleague Bayo Oluwake is also standing by. Good morning, Bayo. Good morning, Yamgul, and it's nice to be on the program once again. Good morning, viewers. I'm glad to announce to everybody that you're talking to us from Nigeria. You're not at Chatham House. You're not in the UK. Everybody seems to be at Chatham House these days. Were I to even be a candidate, and I'm happy I'm not, I would never go to Chatham House. I don't understand this Chatham House business. Um, we are not a colony of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I don't see why we want to pander to uh, a, a think tank, which reasonably is doing a fairly good job, you know, in terms of trying to influence policy uh, around the world and all that. But for our presidential candidates to be trooping to Chatham House, frankly, I, I really don't understand it. I honestly don't understand it. Yeah, where did this all start at all? Because we, we remember that we've had presidents, at least since the return of democracy in 1999, we've had uh, President Olusegun Obasanjo, we've had uh, President Yara Dua of blessed memory, we've had President Jonathan. I don't know if Jonathan even, because he's like the most recent, went for uh, any interview at Chatham House. I remember vividly that it started at the time of Buhari. And I wonder why the craze for Chatham House, uh, why the craze for validity or validation rather uh, by the UK government. And a lot of people have been asking these questions. Whether we understand it or not, do you think there is any good it is is this doing to us or for us as a country? Um, first of all, Chatham House is just like um, several think tanks. Uh, there are quite a number of them um, in the Euro-Atlantic region, especially in the United States. Um, but the think tanks, uh, normally if you would like to um, articulate uh, a policy which you feel that an audience, say that a British audience, needs to understand, uh, or if you feel that that country has, will have a significant role to play, maybe in your presidency or in your, uh, whenever you come to power or whatever, you want to appeal, of course, to the, uh, if you like, what you call the centrifugal or centripetal forces in those countries. Um, I think there are other ways of um, trying to do that, trying to curry either that favor or engage with that critical mass uh, of people who may help you influence that government that you want to rule should you come to power. But I really don't see Chatham House as, as uh, that kind of platform. And I think it's too early in any case uh, for, for anyone to be doing that. Secondly, if we had diaspora voting, and, and we know we have a very huge diaspora in the United Kingdom, probably the, the biggest or the largest, okay, then one would also understand if candidates went to Chatham House and then we could say they want to influence the Nigerians in the UK who would be voting. Exactly. But the Nigerians in the UK will not be voting. Uh, and so, with due respect, I think that um, if you look at countries that are almost on the same level with us, what the Professor Obolaji Akinyemi, when he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, described as a concert of medium powers, okay? Uh, and at that time, India was within that group. Today, India is uh, uh, aspiring to almost becoming a superpower itself. But if you look at countries, Brazil, Nigeria, um, Argentina, uh, South Africa, I don't think presidential candidates of any of those countries who go to the Chatham House. And I, 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 with due respect and with all sense of responsibility, I think that the presidential candidates we have are belittling the influence and prestige of Nigeria by going to Chatham House. This is my personal opinion, uh, and, and I hold strongly to that. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we rise up and play our role the way we should, I mean, this is Nigeria that, in the days of the Obasanjo military, the Britain Obasanjo administration, and given the role we played in the anti-apartheid struggle, 
you know, Nigeria was being courted by every country in the world. We were not the ones going to court them. They were courting us to the extent that the first ever visit by a sitting American president to black Africa, not even black Africa, to Africa took place during that period when President Jimmy Carter visited and stayed in Nigeria for three or four days. And then the late Major General Joseph Gaba became chairperson of the United Nations and Apartheid Committee. He was almost president in perpetuity because every time there was an election, all the countries just unanimously re-elected Nigeria. You see, imagine where we have come from. I don't know if our presidential candidates have a sense of history to know the significance of the largest black country on the planet that they are going to Chatham House to do what? Mm. I don't understand it. It's, it's a question everybody is asking. Everybody who, like you and I, we're just asking this question. Yes, we may have been colonized by uh, the British, but it doesn't mean that we are, like you said, still a colony of the United Kingdom, of, of the British. We are now a sovereign state. And everybody seems like it's the the new normal to be going there to uh, let the people know what you are going to do. And sometimes you even hear more pronouncements, more policy pronouncements when they go out to these other places than when they talk to us here in Nigeria. And, but this also, Bio, uh, it, it speaks to the fact that, like you said, people were looking to us. This Chatham House is a place where intellectuals go, intellectuals go, people uh, think tank, as you call it, we have people like that in Nigeria and we are not able to utilize whatever uh, qualities they have, whatever thing they have upstairs. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why even presidential debates have had debates, you know, a debate about a debate, because some candidates are saying that they cannot go to some Media houses, for instance, because the people who own these media, media houses may be biased and all that. I don't see that as a good excuse anyway, because if you go there and you have something to offer, it's a good uh, avenue to buy over the people who could have been uh, sympathetic to these people who you are calling uh, biased or, or opposition. But does this not tell us that we need a body at least in Nigeria that can handle things like this. Because if we had that body here that is unbiased, uh, so to speak, and then they are leaving that body here to go and talk outside the shores of Nigeria, then we can, we can have an excuse to hold them and say, okay, you are selling us short. But we don't have that body. Maybe the entire guild of editors would come together. Maybe uh, Bonn would come together. Maybe it will be the National Orientation Agency or a marriage of all these agencies and all these bodies coming together to form a, a semblance of Chatham House, where we will have think tanks, people coming to ask the relevant questions, especially in uh, election years like this. But in a case where everybody, uh, all man to himself, God for all, it's making us sell ourselves short and our image, uh, if you ask me, is, is not good enough for a country that prides itself as the giant of Africa. So what can we do now yeah, to yeah. make sure that that Chatham House comes you know, home? <laughs> you know, um, Yangu, it's, it's a tragedy that, okay, I mean, we, we don't, in, in the media, we, we, we are all one, okay? Uh, and I believe that, um, for example, if anybody didn't want to appear before, appear on a particular debate scheduled by a particular uh, media yeah. organization, maybe that person could have asked for the panel, the panel to be diluted, or the panel to have, could have nominated one person mm. to be on that, do you what, get what I'm saying, yeah. to be on that panel. But let's come back to whether we have uh, an equivalent of Chatham House or not. I even think we have something better than Chatham House, and that is the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. And I'm going to prove it. You see, because when we talk of a sense of history, our presidential candidates and the intelligentsia behind them, if ever there was, that the intelligentsia should be the ones who bring these presidential candidates to the realization 
of how they need to project themselves and how because the way they project themselves will be an extension of the way in which Africa and Nigeria itself will be will be seen. The Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, when I spoke about a, a proposal by Professor Bolaji Akiemi when he was Minister of Foreign Affairs, when he proposed the establishment of what he called the concert of medium powers, okay, that was following over from the glorious role that Nigeria played in international relations, uh, leading to the leading to the liberation of southern African countries. And some people have argued that that foreign policy of the Muritana Obasanjo administration, that was a, a, a dynamic foreign policy, uh, a foreign policy that impacted the whole world, that foreign policy was actually articulated at the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs. And we could see in subsequent years how the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs became renowned and was recognized internationally. Several of its directors general actually went on to become permanent representative of Nigeria at the United Nations. Bolaji Akiyemi was director general during the Murita Lafayette administration. He later on became minister of foreign affairs. Um, you have Professor Mrs. Joy Ogu. She was director general of the NIA. She later became Nigerian permanent representative to the United Nations. You had the late Dr. George, Professor George Obiozo. He was director general of the Institute. He later became Nigerian ambassador to the United States. So what are we talking about? That we do not have a think tank in this country where our presidential candidates can go and sit and articulate their positions mm -hmm. than to be rushing to Chatham House. I think this is serious infrastructure. Okay, but my question right now, Bayo, would be that why the why do we have this kind of uh, an institution, the Ni Nigerian Institute of International Affairs? Why were they silent? Why have they been silent? Be because it shouldn't be the presidential candidates or any other candidate for that matter that will have to call on them to come and interview them, to come and have a town hall meeting with them. Why did these people not make a move? to make sure that they have a policy direction of everybody who is uh, aspiring to lead our country. Why the silence? Just like the National Orientation Agency we've been quarreling all the time about, that they are not talking, they are not giving us the right messages at the right time through the right channel, channels and all that. Why did this institution not say something when we needed them to say something? Who should make the move, Bio? That's a very good question, Yambu. And um, to be honest, I wouldn't know why the NIA uh, you know, has been silent on this. It, it doesn't have a tradition, by the way, uh, of convening presidential debates. It doesn't have that tradition. Yeah. I just mentioned the NIA you know, when I needed to prove the argument you know, to, to understand that we have argument. a th think tank. That yes. we have something better than Chatham House, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, and so that's why I mentioned the NIA. But, I mean, having said that, and I agree with the point you're raising, the presidential candidates themselves could initiate that engagement. And I'm sure if they had initiated that engagement, the NIA would not have turned them down. The argument here is how come, on the one hand, you want to, you, you tell us that when you become president of Nigeria, you will enhance the dignity of us as Nigerians and the dignity of our country. But on the other hand, you are making you are you are you are belittling the even the candidacy for the position of the presidency of Nigeria by by rushing off to this Chatham House, you know. Um, and and frankly, we, we we discussed the other day on the program about foreign policy of the presidential candidates. Yes, yes. You remember, and we yeah. said we have not seen any. So even if there was a foreign policy, for example. Uh, and, and it had something to do maybe with the European Union. The United Kingdom is no longer part of, sorry, Britain is no longer part of the, of the EU. Mm -hmm. But assuming that the presidential candidate has a possible foreign policy engagement, should he become president, that has to do specifically with the United Kingdom, and chooses to go to Chatham House to speak only on that, mm -hmm. I will still understand. But you don't go to Chatham House to begin to articulate what you want to do for Nigeria. Who is, who, who, what is Chatham House? You are saying that you cannot go to 
to, to the NIIA in Nigeria, you cannot initiate engagement with any of our universities to convene such discourse. You, I mean, I find it absolutely ridiculous. There is the Shehu Musa Yaradra Center in Abuja, which can also play such a role, by the way. There are several, several uh, institutions and think tanks in this country that can play this same role. But all of them just are rushing. And by the way, interestingly, at a time where the United Kingdom is no longer a force in international affairs, she is not in international relations today. The United Kingdom is an appendage of the United States. The, the, the power projection of the United Kingdom is dependent on the direction and the whims and caprices of the United States. Mm. So if you went to the United States, I would still even excuse that. You're going to the United Kingdom. I mean, okay. the, the powers uh, that... today are in Asia. If you were going to Asia, to, 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 to India, to think tanks in New Delhi, to think tanks in China, to think, ta think tanks in Singapore, to think tanks in South Korea, then I will even understand and say because the bulk of the investments in Africa in the last 15 years have been coming from Asia. So then I will understand that you're probably trying to present yourself to these countries that are the biggest investors and supporters of infrastructure and economic development in Africa. You are going to the United Kingdom, with due respect, that has lost relevance. Okay, in fairness to them, anyway, even though I don't know how true it is, but all of them say that uh, they were being invited by these people. And if this were to be true, then I'd also say that our people should bor borrow a leave. Because if you are a body that is capable of doing what the Chatham House is doing, you should also try to extend an invitation to show that you're concerned about what is going to happen in the next four years, or as it as has become a tradition in Nigeria almost in the next eight years as it is. So let these bodies come together. It, this is a call. I'm just making an appeal because even if the, the presidential aspirants or candidates do not have like a club or an organization or a union of presidential candidates that will say, okay, let us go to uh, this uh, is NIIA and make them invite us. So the people should take that initiative as well. National Orientation, NIIA, uh, uh, Guild of Editors, whoever can ask the relevant questions, come together. Let's have a deliberate policy or a deliberate, um, is it a rule I'll call it? I don't even know the name to call it. But let's be deliberate about making sure that we have this kind of debate under an umbrella that will be adjudged as unbiased and intelligent enough and... Uh, credible enough for everybody to appear because it helps us have homegrown ideas thrown back at us here in the home front instead of us listening to Chatham House, to tuning to BBC, for instance, and also uh, making us lose money even in uh, just doing that kind of action. So subsequently, I think we should have a body like this led by, as you have said, the NIIA because they have everything relevant to this cause that we're trying to fight now. So there should be something like this, so that in the next circle of election, in the next Olympic of election, as I call it, we can have something like this here in Nigeria. And whoever leaves Nigeria to go to another place to talk, we will start looking at him and asking him why he left and went there. Perhaps because uh, the sitting president, Muhammad Buhari, went to Chatham House and he came back and he won. Maybe every other person is just following that and thinking that when you go there, they'll be much influenced. They will see you as a, a global being so that they will vote for you. I don't know why, why, what their argument is. And now everybody is going to Chatham House. Even INEC, that is not contesting, went to Chatham House. Yesterday, INEC uh, chairman, Professor Mahmoud, was in Chatham House. They, Professor Yakubu Mahmoud says the commissioning will not be, or the commission rather, will not be shifting anything about the election. The February 25 and March 11 dates for the 2023 general elections, and the commission is also prepared for a runoff election if the need arises. Yakubu, who decried the spate of attacks on its facilities in form of arson, 
said 50 facilities of the commission had been attacked in four years. He, however, vowed that the 2023 general election would hold in spite of the attacks, explaining that the commission would need to continue to rebuild the burned facilities and replace materials. Yakubu said the turnout for new registration was very high and that at the moment Nigerian voters were 16.7 million, more than the rest of West Africa. That is quite a number. He revealed that over 600,000 PVCs were collected in Lagos in the last month and lamented that the state had the largest number of uncollected cards. He also stated that most of the collected PVCs were from newly registered votes, while uncollected PVCs date to 2015. And while he was speaking on voters who have been displaced as a result of insecurity in the Northeast and Northwest, he said the commission would conduct polls in internally displaced persons, IDP camps, to ensure that no one is disenfranchised. He also said the commission would conduct mock elections in some select states to test the use of the technology to be deployed. INEC has also said that the 2023 election is majorly for young people because they make up a larger percentage of eligible voters. And he gave a breakdown of the voters register ahead of the polls. He said there are 93.4 million registered voters, of which 37 million, that is 39.5%, are young people between the ages of 18 and 34. They are closely followed by 33.4 million, or 36.75%, middle-aged voters between 35 and 49 years old. And put together, these two categories constitute 75.39% of registered voters in Nigeria. So we already know the age bracket that is going to make a difference in the 2023 election. And in his own words, actually the 2023 election is the election of young people because they have the numbers. Even the majority of the PVCs collected are collected by young people. So out of 93.4 million registered voters, 70.4 million are between the ages of 18 and 49. Recently, we have had religious leaders appealing to the public on patriotism and exercising their rights to vote. Undoubtedly, religion has been a dominant factor in Nigerian politics. Religion has been a potent factor in Nigerian politics and its influence in elections cannot be undermined. Still the run-up and we're in the final lap of this journey. Uh, we, no matter how uh, disappointed we are that we have to make pronouncements only when we get out of the shores of this land. Going to Chatham House is the in thing now for presidential candidates and everybody who wants his voice to be heard. And like we were saying, it's absolutely unnecessary. But whatever it is, we will still take some some things that were said at the Chatham House, especially by Professor uh, Yakubu Mahmoud, who is the chairman of uh, the Independent. National Electoral Commission. Uh, Bio, one of the interesting things that uh, was said there uh, was the fact that Nigeria now has over 16 million more votes than the rest of Africa. And it tells us that uh, we, we have a big population and we have people that can decide for a country as big as Nigeria. But how much are we ready to exercise that power? He also talked about the fact that the election belongs to the youths, people who are between 18 and 49. Even though the bulk of them are also between 18 and 34, the others that are following that closely are those that are between 35 and 49. And do you really think the youths are even ready to take this advantage and do the needful? We are ready. Um, I think that we have had um, certain instances that have persuaded our young population that they can make a difference. Uh, I mean, at the risk of uh, repeating what might be a cliche, we've seen what has happened in the entertainment industry, uh, which is entirely dominated by young people. We've seen the height that they have taken Nigeria internationally. Uh, we've seen the creative arts. We've seen what they do in uh, both at home, in our universities at home. We've seen our young people scoring exceptional grade point averages. We've seen uh, exceptional number of PhDs being produced in some of our universities. 
Uh, and then, of course, in foreign universities, our young people have continued to dominate. So uh, I am persuaded that our young people are ready, they are prepared, they can play their role in the electoral space as well. Um, but talking about um, the number of voters, uh, I assume what Professor Yakubo was alluding to is the fact that we have 16 million people more than the rest of West Africa in, in terms of population. That those registered to vote in Nigeria are uh, even 16 million more than the population, you know, if you put the whole number together. We, are, we equal the number and then we, are, we have 16. So in other words, all those registered to vote in Nigeria are more than the population of Ghana, Togo, Bene, Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, uh, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, and so on, and so on and so forth, which is very interesting. Um, but let's hope, like we said, that the issue of the PVCs, which we have discussed on this program severally, uh, will be addressed because he gave us an insight into one dimension to the problem, which is that this huge number of uncollected PVCs are actually not a consequence of the recent registration, yeah. but they date back to uncollected PVCs from 2011. So, you see, you and I were talking with the, with the, with the guests a couple of days ago, Yanko, uh, and we, we brought up this issue that our people do not like to go and, uh, uh, you know, play their civic roles largely. So, if from 2011, a substantial number of the uncollected PVCs date as far back as 2011. It is only corroborating what you and I were saying on the program. Uh, although our guest didn't agree with us and was, uh, you know, understandably so, his position was different, you know, but the INEC chairman just confirmed what we were saying. Okay, yeah. Well, it, the good thing is that he said most of the newly collected VVCs are from or by the people who registered newly. And these are the people that we are hoping will make the difference in this election. But beyond elections, uh, when people come into power, uh, there are some other things like in China, for instance, where if you are found guilty of corruption, very stringent measures are taken against you. And I think uh, one of these is even leading to uh, the ultimate prize for anything, a, a death penalty and all that. I read a story this morning about someone who robbed a lady of 57,000 naira and he has been sentenced to death here in Nigeria, here in Lagos. He's a vulcanizer and he did that. Well, the law says that um, armed robbery comes with a certain kind of penalty, which maybe that also is a part of it. But I was just thinking, 57,000 naira, because he was holding a scissors, it's, it translates to armed robbery. But 57,000 naira, he could have killed someone with a scissors, I agree. But how many people die because of the fact that some people uh, high up in the ladder of uh, governance or anything uh, steal so much money in billions, not thousands, in billions, uh, how, how many people die because of this category of people? So, for instance, you still a billion naira meant for maybe a road that is passing to a particular village and because the road is not done people go there and they get accidents there and they die or some people are being robbed because you have to slow down in some portions of the road and so on and so forth what is being done what are the measures put in place to make sure that these people face the music in a very serious case Yes, I agree, 57,000, and you, are where you were holding a scissors, someone could have died. But what about the people who steal millions? Maybe there should be laws that are stronger that will hold these people accountable. I don't know what you think about it, Bio. Um, somebody is convicted, somebody is found mm -hmm. guilty, and he's going to face uh, the firing squad. Okay, death by hanging, as they said, here in Nigeria. What about the people who steal billions? What should be done? I mean, you, you, you rightfully pointed to the Chinese um, example. The penalty for corruption in China in their legal uh, framework is, is, is capital punishment, is death. Mm. It's, in the, it's in the law books, okay? 
So, um, uh, yes, I believe stringent penalties should be in our, in our legal regime as well That's to proper. deal with this problem. Yeah. You know, uh, I believe that strongly. And this is up to the incoming uh, gladiators, if you like, yeah. yes. But just quickly, okay. uh, also we need to recognize that in Nigeria, people who do these things are celebrated. It's not just... Uh, it's not just a problem of uh, the statute books, you know, what is in the legal regime. If these people steal money and they go, the society worships them. They are made chair, chairpersons of at wedding ceremonies. Yeah. And if you move against them, they say, okay, it's from my village. But the other person, when he did that, you didn't do anything. So society itself encourages it. Okay. So if we're going to deal with this problem, it's not just going to be legal. It's also going to be moral. And it's also going to mean that we boycott such people completely. That's what happens in China. You are not celebrated. Nobody invites you. Okay. You know? So we need to, it, it's, it's got to be holistic, you know, in my view. All right. Well, um, in my village, they will ostracize you. They will disgrace you. They will do a lot of things if you steal public money and all that. But, well, uh, it's, this is where we have to draw the curtain, but not before or we say a very, very hearty cheers to our managing director at Plus TV Africa, Mr. Lekon Ogumbongo. We just call him Uncle Lekon because that is how dear he is to us. And he's more a friend, more of a friend than a boss. So happy birthday, Mr. Ogumbongo. And I'm sure you wanted to just say happy birthday to him and then we'll wrap up uh, bio. Yes, I wish him, I wish Lekon many, many happy returns. He's a doyen in the broadcast industry, he's yeah. a leading light, and he's a very good role model. I wish him long life and prosperity. Okay, that's how the, the much we can take today on the program. We will return tomorrow with uh, the run-up once again. From my colleague, uh, Bayo... Oluwake and myself, Yamgula. I, I nearly changed your name. <laughs> and myself, Yamgula Gaji. Let's do it again tomorrow. Bye for now.